Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, welcome back to one of the many roundtables that uh, I've been hosting to have conversations about what's happening in Vermont on a range of topics. And folks can always watch this uh, live as you are now on Facebook, or uh, you can always come back to it on Facebook and always find it uh, links to it on our uh, campaign page, zuckerunfrbt.com to find not only this conversation, but any and all the conversations we've had with uh, environmental folks, educators, early child care folks, medical professionals, and others. Today we're going to discuss higher education in Vermont. Uh, the, both colleges and universities uh, have long been an important part of Vermont's economy uh, with an approximately $637 billion annual impact. And it's been a big part of our identity. Uh, we're one of the highest per capita college student populations in the country. And like many other parts of the Vermont economy, uh, the institutions of higher education have been strongly impacted by COVID-19. Uh, but even before the pandemic, they were struggling with demographic realities of declining enrollment and overarching funding challenges. And so we're having a conversation today, not only about the COVID-19 impact, but really the broader situation as well. Our guests today come from Vermont's uh, four colleges and universities, and we'll be talking with them about what they're facing today and what they believe the future will look like for higher education in the state. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman, by the way, and uh, joining me today are Julia Roberts, uh, Professor of Linguistics, and she's the president of the UVM AAUP-AFT Union. It's the union for full-time faculty at UVM. We have Mike Bozia, Professor of Political Science at St. Michael's College, and he's the president of St. Michael's College chapter of the American Association of university professors, which is AAUP, as I mentioned that earlier. We have Mike Kelly, the Associate Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies and the immediate past president of the Faculty Senate at Champlain College. And we have David Rouse. Uh, he's an adjunct faculty member at Northern Vermont University and Champlain College, and he, an officer of the adjunct faculty union at Champlain College. I wanna mention that these guests here are to engage in this discussion about policy and resources, and their participation uh, does not constitute a political endorsement. Uh, so also, if you have any thoughts or questions, please post them in the comments, uh, and we will do our best to integrate them into the conversation or uh, follow up and try to get answers to those questions uh, and get them to you. Um, so first, I'm going to be asking a question about what's going to happen in the fall. Uh, but before I do that, I want to start by asking each of my guests just to introduce themselves and briefly describe what their institutions are telling them about um, the upcoming semester, but really maybe just introduce yourselves first for a moment. I'll start with uh, Julie, please. Okay, yes, um, I'm Julie Roberts, uh, whoops, and um, I am the faculty union president, United Academics president at the University of Vermont. I'm also a linguistics professor, and um, I've been in Vermont and at UVM for 25 years. And did you want me to talk about the fall or not? I got confused, sorry. We'll get into the fall in just a moment. Okay. Mike, Mike Bazio, why don't you tell us about yourself for a moment? Um, hi, I'm a, a professor at St. Michael's College. I've just promoted to professor uh, this month. Uh, I started at St. Mike's in 2005. Um, I used to live in Hardwick where my husband and I owned a restaurant called Claire's. Many of you may know about it. Um, on the campus, I was just elected uh, president of the AAUP chapter and have served for two years on the faculty welfare committee um, and going into serving on the budget review committee. Great. Thank you for that. And yes, Claire's is quite famous. Uh, Mike Kelly at Champlain College, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Mike Kelly and I'm an associate professor of interdisciplinary studies at Champlain uh, and I've served in a variety of roles uh, in faculty governance, including uh, Senate Vice President, uh, Senate President, and now I'm the immediate past president. Uh, and so in addition to uh, the teaching work that I do in the interdisciplinary studies uh, program that we have, I also am uh, the founder of the degree design lab at Champlain College as well. Great, thank you. And finally, uh, David Rouse, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, then we'll get into the questions. Uh, my name is David Rouse. I am adjunct faculty in the Writing and Literature and Humanities departments at Northern Vermont University, formerly Johnson State College. Uh, and I am part of their adjunct faculty union, uh, but I'm much more active in the Champlain College adjunct faculty union, uh, where I have served as 
uh, chair, vice chair, and steward um, intermittently and uh, alternatively, perhaps, for the last five or six years. Well, thank you all for joining us today. I do appreciate it. And uh, I guess the first question really is how are faculty, all of you are faculty, but if you've also been talking with students and, and staff uh, at each of your respective institutions reacting to the announcement that learning will be partly in person in the fall. Are they excited about it because it's in person? Are they nervous about it because of the risk of COVID? What's the general reaction? And um, David, you're on my screen first, so why don't you give me a thought on, on what you're hearing from folks? Uh, most of what I've heard, especially from students, is that they are very, very eager to get back to campus. Obviously, most of the excitement and pleasure of the college experience is related to being on campus. Uh, if you take that out of it, it's, it's an intellectual exercise, and that's important for many of them, but for a lot of 18 to 20-year-olds, they want the college life and experience. Most of my faculty colleagues that I have spoken to are also enthusiastic about getting back to work many of them really, really want to get back on campus because face-to-face -face teaching is more effective. It's more gratifying. It's more engaging. It's more fun. But at the same time, a lot of them I know have serious uh, concerns about the safety protocols, and many of them doubt potentially the efficacy or the feasibility or both of, of the proposed safety protocols. Would somebody else like to jump in? Uh either Mike or Julie? Sure, I'll go next. Um, uh, my situation is, is fairly um, similar to the one just described. I would say as union president, I'm mostly hearing from faculty. And I would say a large number of faculty are very nervous about safety, um, not just our own safety, which is, um, definitely part of it. We do, I don't know about the other schools, but we certainly have an aging faculty. So many of us are for one reason or another in one as, um, high risk group or another, or live with people who are in those groups. So it is quite concerning. And I think mostly faculty would like a larger voice in determining how we are going to be teaching in the fall. And right now we don't have that kind of assurance. So I would say um, having a voice in our governance is an even bigger um, challenge and worry than um, this COVID situation itself. And uh, Mike Kezia, what, what are your thoughts? Kelly, excuse me. They're both, excuse me, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so one of the things uh, that I think uh, Champlain deserves a lot of credit for is, is the, in the flex hybrid design that we're being asked to teach in in the fall, uh, it gives both students and faculty uh, the choice to teach and learn in a setting that's most conducive to uh, their individual situation. And I think that that degree of flexibility is the uh, kind of ethos that is going to be important to maintain. Uh, and a big part of that, like Julie was saying, is uh, adequate faculty representation within that decision making process. And uh, Mike Bazio, you got some thoughts? Yeah, I just want to add um, a couple of things. At, at St. Mike's, um, we've actually brought in um, a committee of 35 faculty and staff to work out what the protocols are going to be. We'll be having a two-day workshop at the beginning of July to go over how to implement the hybrid model. Um, what we heard kind of resoundingly from students uh, after March 18th last, uh, last semester um, and we see in evidence in our kind of robust enrollments of first year students for the fall uh, that what's attractive about our campuses, I think collectively in Vermont, is uh, the experience of a community and the experience of learning in person um, and learning with peers. And um, as, as David was saying, and to lose that um, is to, to many of us, our faculty, a threat to the way we do, not only the way we do our work, but the very mission of education itself. Um, so we're working out those kinds of protocols as well as on faculty welfare committee, we've been talking with the administration about how to enable faculty who have concerns um, to teach in, in a more remote situation, um, as long as students have the opportunity for the robust community life that they expect. And, and just briefly to go from this a little bit in terms of 
remote or in person learning, I'm, I'm curious about the, um, the quality. David early on talked about sort of that in-person quality of teaching, that quality of experience uh, in the bigger picture, uh, in the world of remote learning, which started being pushed in New Hampshire, you know, system and some other places. Uh, do, do you think that's going to be an issue going forward, you know, sort of five and 10 years, as well as, as we talk about the immediate situation? Do any of you have a thought on that? I'm going off on a tangent here, but it was just related to David's question, David's comment earlier. So can I start with that? I'm actually um, in the midst today, we're, we're launching our um, online second semester in the summer. Um, and I'm teaching uh, my introductory comparative politics class in this section. Uh, and the, we've done hybrid models in the summer. Um, this is my first online opportunity. And of course, the experience at the end of last semester in kind of a hybrid model. Um, that there's something that's incredibly valuable about the experience of engaging with the material in a classroom setting, even if it's online but synchronous, um, in a way that allows students and groups to talk with a faculty member about the material that you lose in an online course. It's not that online courses don't serve a purpose. They do serve a purpose, and many students take them precisely for the purpose they serve. Uh, but in their overall education, um, students desire that kinds of um, high capacity engagement, um, whether it's synchronous, online, or in person. Anybody else have a thought they want to chime in on that before I go on to the next series or uh, related to that teaching? I, I, I would agree with, uh, with Michael because the, the fact is, the life of a college is, is in its campus. And so I understand that we really need to consider, and, and, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be able to teach remotely, but in the long run, we have to get the students back to campus in as large numbers as possible for the viability of the community and for the viability of the school itself. Um, and, and I know that that's a big concern for all of the administrations involved. I just am not sure what that the happy medium is between providing that and re-embracing the campus model and maintaining some semblance of safety, at, at least in the short term. I, I'm not sure when I think it's gonna be safe and I'm not sure how long schools can go without bringing back their communities to campus. But that's, that's the big question right now, as far as I can tell. Yeah, so this really rolls into the next topic, which is, um, some of the changes, or in some instances, cuts that your institutions have made in response to COVID-19 and what impact you think they'll have, whether it's on the student experience, the faculty experience, future enrollments or, or whatnot. So um, Mike, uh, excuse me, Mike K, uh, please explain what's going on at uh, maybe Champlain College to start and we'll go, go through with the others. So we're kicking off with the relatively good news uh, because I think compared to a lot of the colleagues uh, share, I'm sharing a panel with, Champlain is actually in a pretty good spot. Uh, so, uh, so far uh, in this next budget year, uh, we are uh, not projecting any cuts. Uh, we are not projecting any layoffs, uh, but these things could uh, very well uh, change depending on what the pandemic does. Uh, so if for whatever reason the pandemic uh, prevents us from opening up in the way that we expect to, uh, then we could stand to lose a considerable amount of money as the result and have to rethink a lot of our priorities. Well, thank you. And uh, Mike Bezier? So yeah, I would say that we suffered a significant hit um, because we reimbursed students for housing expenses when they returned home. Um, and for ongoing students, continuing students, we credited um, their housing expenses to their future housing expenses. Um, and so that produced already um, a shortfall that exceeded the uh, federal aid that we were able to obtain. Um, going up, going forward, um, our, though our our new admissions are higher than we expected. Um, they're not as high as we need uh, to sustain the college at its current capacities. Um, and so that's a, a pressure that we're facing. The board is actually going to be deciding this week about some program re restructuring 
um, that the faculty has been debating for the last two weeks. Um, there have been um, terminations and compensation reductions, um, and we don't think at this point that those are out of line with the trends go that are going on across the country. Um, there has been a mixture of engagement uh, with faculty rather successfully, and um, and some uh, resistance to faculty initiatives as well. I'm actually following up briefly with you for a moment before I go to Julie. Um, you're mentioned enrollment twice now, and I've been wondering about whether Vermont's in a position to sell at the Vermont institutions, maybe more so the state colleges, so maybe David Later could address this some, but even Burlington is not a major city the way many big institutions are in. And I'm curious whether Vermont's relatively low COVID situation, particularly in the rural areas, uh, may be a selling factor for the rural institutions and even the Burlington institutions. Do you have any thoughts on that? Have you heard any of that through the enrollment topic? We are talking about that quite a lot in our um, marketing and, and enrollment efforts um, this, this year. Um, there's a couple of things that we have going for us. One is we have extra capacity in dorm space. So when um, students, uh, uh, if students exhibit symptoms, we can give them isolated housing where they can um, self-quarantine for the necessary two weeks or until they get testing. Vermont also has incredibly good testing capacity compared to other rural states that have small colleges and universities as well. So that helps us kind of avoid um, the, the worst case scenarios that we could imagine. Um, all those things in some ways make Vermont a better place. Um, on the flip side of that is the, the risk to faculty. The, you know, the Vermont population is older. That means our faculty is older as well. Um, and older faculty uh, are more susceptible to having underlying conditions or living with people who have underlying conditions. Um, and so that makes our concerns of the faculty a little bit different than the concerns of um, students and their parents. Yeah. And uh, Julie, uh, what are your thoughts on um, the original question of sort of the, the cuts or adjustments that are being made uh, to COVID-19 and the impact you think they'll have? Yeah, um, I wish that I felt as positively as some of my colleagues here do, but I'm going to assume that some of the people who are seeing this panel also read the newspaper and um, if they live in Burlington, they've heard the car horns from the demonstrations that some of our UVM groups have had. So clearly we are not all happy campers at UVM. And again, the overarching challenge has been faculty governance and or the lack thereof coming from the administration and particularly the administration has refused to engage with the union at all over these cuts and the outcome of that has been that the cuts that have been made and the decreases in salary so cutbacks as well as um, as well as cuts have been made where they can be made without violating the contract. So that means that those affected are primarily the lesser paid, the more insecure faculty and staff that we have on campus. And that is, that's an incredibly demoralizing situation. If I can have like 30 more seconds, oh, um, sure. give an example, our non-tenure track lecturers have been cut back from 100% to 75% which sounds like you know not a huge deal perhaps, although a quarter of your salary is always a huge deal. But in fact, what they're going to be doing is they're gonna be working their full-time jobs in the fall, but being paid for 75% because the classes in the fall are already enrolled. So you can't cancel those classes, obviously. So that is going to keep them from getting unemployment probably, and certainly, occupy their time to such an extent that they can't get another job or it's going to be very difficult. Then in January, um, if the enrollments stay as we hope they will, those, in, those lectures in theory will be brought up to 100%, but because of how payroll is done, they cannot be paid 100%. They will be pay, doing those extra classes on overload, which means they'll be, be doing their whole job 
for less money than they were getting last year. So, and again, all of that was kind of a run around the union and the contract because these faculty happened to have um, reappointment and workload deadlines that allowed the, the administration to do this um, without having to open the contract. I will also say very quickly that the union has many times offered to pair, partner with the administration and come up with um, a progressive collaborative set of cuts that share, where we all share whatever burden comes up and we've been turned down at every juncture. And, and we do know that, that UVM funding as a flagship university as well as state college funding has been a challenge in the state budgets ever since Absolutely. I've been in the legislature and, and fighting for more. And um, that's one of the factors along with, of course, decreasing enrollment. Uh, some of that's being addressed uh, in the current COVID relief funding budgets to try to reduce some of those cuts, but I don't know that it's, uh, that it's enough to alleviate all of them. Uh, David Rouse, why don't you um, go ahead and, and uh, give your perspective with uh, you know, NVU and, and some Champlain as well. There's, there's two things that I would like to address. First, the, the, the big picture for Northern Vermont is uh, it, it's a little bit more drastic and dramatic perhaps than any of the other institutions. Uh, the Chancellor Jeb Spaulding this past spring moved to have the three campuses of the Vermont State College system, including NVU Johnson and NVU Linden, uh, be closed completely. Uh, that's obviously about as drastic a cut as we can have. This is not exclusively because of COVID-19. This has been a problem, as far as I can see, at least as far back as the 2008 recession, which began an incremental reduction of enrollment and support from the state legislature. Although the support from the state legislature has been dwindling since the 1980s. And I think that is ultimately as big a concern to NVU as COVID is. Um, not only would closing NVU cost many, many working class young Vermonters the best available and most practical option to get ahead in life, to increase their professional opportunities, to try to get some semblance of economic stability, uh, but it would also cause a lot of trouble for the roughly 100 full-time employees, at least, that are on the Johnson campus alone. And if those people lose their jobs, that's going to affect all of the other businesses, as well as all of their family members, their neighborhoods, et cetera. So COVID is a precipitating event that has brought this crisis to a head, but it's been growing for at least a decade, arguably two to three decades. And, and like I said, this is just bringing it to a head. If there is any more available time, I could address how this situation impacts part-time adjunct faculty in particular, but I don't need to tie up this whole conversation and I realize we might be able to get to that in another question anyway. Right, give, it, give it a minute or two, go for it. Okay, uh, all faculty members that are trying to deal with adjusting their teaching approach, pr producing something like this flex hybrid program, uh, that is going to require extra work. If you are cooking up a brand new class from scratch, it, it takes a good deal of time. You have to invest the time and the energy, of course, and this is to be expected. But when you also have to prepare a class that might be running online or might be running on campus, face-to-face, -face, in person, but has to be adaptable on the spur of the moment to become an online class, it's just a little bit of extra work. And again, all faculty would have to deal with something like this. Adjunct faculty typically is only paid to teach the class and however much time they have to put into the preparation of the class is their own problem, their own time, their own concern. Um, it is also an issue because many adjunct faculty members at all of the schools that we represent today um, teach at multiple institutions. So you can't give yourself 100% to any one time and place. Uh, you either have to pick where you're going to invest yourself or you have to figure out the best way to divide your time between, in my case, Champlain and Northern Vermont. Um, I have colleagues that teach at Champlain uh, and CCV or at Champlain and St. Mike's. Um, it, this is a very common situation for part-time faculty, and we arguably have a more difficult, arguably not necessarily a more difficult position, because when there are cuts, typically they start with us. Uh, mm -hmm. We have much less job security. Obviously, an institution is going to save less money if they cancel an adjunct position than a full-time faculty position, 
but it's a lot easier to furlough or get rid of uh, adjunct faculty. We have less job security. That's all there is to it. It's the nature of the beast. Well, and and you mentioned as uh, as employee as employees are reduced, or if, of course whole campuses were eliminated, the impact on regional economies is huge. Uh, my understanding of the NVU campuses uh, have a hundred thirty seven million dollar impact in the general community because both students and faculty eat locally, rent rooms, they're part of the community, you get haircuts, shop at the local stores for their needs. Uh, and so the, the impacts of, of closing institutions would be huge, but actually the impact of remote learning will also be huge because if someone, some of the students do live in the neighborhoods and communities, this is their opportunity, obviously, as I think David mentioned, but for some of the students that come from farther away, if they're learning remotely, they're not buying their food locally. They're not paying local bills and so forth. So the impacts can be pretty significant. And maybe Mike, uh, Bezia, you know a little bit about that, having been up in the Hardwick area, what, what the impact of those students was in, uh, in your region and, and maybe parents coming for, you know, visiting their kids and going out to eat at your restaurant. What, what did you see for some of that impact real quick before we, we get to the next piece? Yeah, I can say just from my own experience in, in Hardwick and in, in the Northeast Kingdom, um, in particular uh, with Johnson State and um, with Sterling College, uh, the, the students that were passing through um, who lived on campus and lived in the community, and I'm, by passing through I mean with their a couple of years, provided an, an incredible economic um, stimulus to the community. Uh, they did labor, uh, they worked in jobs, many of them worked at Claire's, uh, they socialized, they purchased, um, they did, they were involved in the community and they helped sustain and develop the farming community um, that surrounded Hardwick. Uh, and that's, you know, the, the impact, the economic impact of higher education in especially mid-sized and small communities is, is irreplaceable. There's no way that we can imagine our communities without, even Burlington, without the significant enrollments at UVM. Um, that's not, uh, this isn't, there's this nothing that can replace the, the economic impact that higher education has in these communities. Thank you. And, and that really rolls into the next question, which has to do with some of the structural issues affecting higher ed in Vermont, in particular, the NVU, VTC, potential closing. Jeb, Jeb's plan to close those three campuses was partly in response to the pandemic, partly in response to those chronic uh, structural challenges. I think David mentioned, you know, 10, 20, even 40 years of decreased percentage funding for those institutions, uh, which earlier I pointed out Vermont's identity as a higher student per capita ratio than a lot of the country also means it's harder for the state to fund some of those public institutions to the rates that some of the other uh, states may do. So we've got this, this wonderfulness of all the higher education facilities and this challenge for the state to fund them. Uh, but now uh, there's the idea of closing those institutions. And I'm curious, the impact would be felt by all campuses and all regions. Obviously, the closed institutions would be most drastically impacted, but there may be impacts on the others. And I'm just wondering if each of you just have a few seconds you want to throw in there on what the impacts of closing these campuses would do. It's been a broad discussion, so we don't need to go into it for a long time, but uh, curious. And, and David, you're you know, you're still at NVU uh, and Mike Bezio, you were up in that area. So maybe I'll start with David and Mike and move on to Mike Kelly and close with Julie. I, I, I would emphasize the Im impact that it would have on working class Vermont students uh, because already some of them have to, UVM is very expensive for a state school. Obviously it's the flagship and there are less expensive options available, but if you are trying to stay reasonably close to home, your options are further reduced. And there simply aren't that many avenues to, to improve your lot in life if you can't pursue a bachelor's degree. So although I love having a job and being able to teach at NBU, and I can't underestimate the importance of $137 million per year of, of, of economic support that the school generates through its, its payroll, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, the biggest, longest term impact and what's going to matter most and what I feel should matter most is that it's simply going to be limiting the opportunities 
to a lot of hardworking Vermont students who don't have a lot of money in their families and who don't have a lot of opportunity. And if we take this away, what do we expect them to do? Where do we expect them to take Vermont in the next generation? Thank you. And uh, Mike B? So yeah, I would, I would just back that up. Um, in rural Vermont, um, my experience with the community is that uh, uh, people have a slim margin to live their lives. Um, farmers, small businesses, um, artisans and artists um, and craftspeople um, are not, they're not, you know, the most well paid occupations, um, to say it, to say it at least. Um, and so people are often struggling with a variety of different ways to make money. Um, and that means access to higher education for their children um, in the local community where they're not so distant and travel is not required. Um, and that's affordable um, and it's kind of the first leg up is vitally important. Um, my, neither of my parents graduated from high school. Uh, I went to a state commuter school in California and um, I uh, horrify my students when I tell them it cost me $60 a semester. But if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have gotten a college degree and I wouldn't be able to have gotten a PhD and to teach. Um, and so those institutions provide a leg up for first and second generation college students um, that's vital uh, for economic stability. You know, we like to say we need to increase, um, we need to make college more affordable. But at the same time, we need to increase the number of seats in colleges. We, as a society, we don't graduate enough people if we consider that the college degree is equivalent to the high school degree of 50 years ago. Yeah. It'd be interesting uh, to look back at the $60 a semester. What was the marginal, national marginal tax rate at the time? and how much federal funding and state funding went to state and, and institutions and or school and student loans and support. Um, we've seen marginal tax rate cuts since the 1940s when they were up at 80 and 90 percent times now into the 30s. And uh, those costs are getting pushed on to us all through higher costs for higher ed and everything else. Um, but in any case, uh, Mike Kelly and then uh, Julie, yeah, that's a really nice transition into what I was thinking about as well. Um, and I think that uh, part of what makes Mike B's story so resonant uh, is this uh, notion that uh, of the public of education as a public good and higher education more specifically as a public good. And I think we've gotten away from that uh, a little bit. Uh, and it's not just in Vermont, but it's nationally too, where higher education is uh, this viewed as this commodity as opposed to this public good. And uh, I, I think that everybody on this panel today has uh, done a really nice job of articulating the uh, economic impacts that it's uh, that uh, the higher the perilous time in higher ed is going to have uh, but what we haven't talked as much about is uh, Vermont's potential as a leader in getting back to that notion of higher education as a public good and a public service and something that we can invest in. And so I think that one of the things that as Vermonters we can do uh, is uh, you know, sort of cultivate uh, that mentality and hope that it uh, spreads uh, more nationally uh, going forward, like we've seen Vermont be able to do in other sectors like uh, like farming, like environment, like the environment. Uh, and let's make higher ed one of those things as well. Great. And Drew, I'm curious your thoughts. Obviously, the closing of those institutions is, is geographically a little farther away, but you know, do you see impacts there and state funding issues even for UVM? Um, I do. I don't know if this is what you were thinking about, but um, Vermont, of course, has a very high rate of high school graduation and comparatively low rate of students who go on to college. And obviously, if you start closing some of these college options, there's going to be um, there's gonna be even more of that trend, which I think hurts all Vermonters. The only other thing I wanna say about this is I have noticed um, some you know, pitting of colleges against and universities against each other 
And I want to stress that that is just so um, counterproductive. We, as one positive outcome of the pandemic, if there can be any, is that we have done more work with the um, unions of the Vermont State Colleges, not less, and also with Champlain and St. Mike's and their AAUP groups. And I, I just think it's so important to make this something that we are all in together. We will not, you know, if, if one college closes um, and a couple of students co come over to UVM, that's a very small gain compared to the huge loss to the state. Yeah, no, I think that's really true. Um, so we, um, there's been, I don't know, I've heard a lot of talk and sometimes in political circles and or memes, there's discussion of businesses reinventing themselves, higher education has to reinvent itself. There's sort of this taking it away from that, that human side that some of us talked about earlier with respect to what is higher education. I think Mike Kelly spoke to it uh, really well as a public good. Um, and there's this topic of higher ed having to reinvent itself. Uh, to respond to these challenges. And of course, fully remote learning would be a reinvention that really changes the structure. I think David also talked about that, that in-person structure and, and the socialization as well as the education and what those two things mean together in those final years of the developing brain uh, as folks are in their late teens and 20s. Of course, there's non-traditional students as well. But in reinventing themselves, the higher ed institutions, to respond to both the demographic and COVID-19 challenges. What changes are, you, are, you, are your institutions were already making before the pandemic? How has uh, COVID-19 accelerated or changed those? And how might you see alternative ways to change that maybe the institutions aren't doing? Um, whether it's certain marketing, whether it's focusing on certain degrees, you name it. So it's kind of a big open question about reinventing. What are the institutions doing? Uh, pre and post COVID-19 and what do you see that maybe is a, a way that from what you're hearing with students may be a more creative and uh, longer term sustainable way to um, do that. So uh, feel free to jump in, um, you know, maybe some quick thoughts. We'll have some back and forth. Really, this is a, a big part of the conversation today. Julie, you're on my screen, so we'll go with you. Okay, great. I'm ready. Um, yeah, I think that some changes have were being made pre-pandemic. I know um, as a linguistics faculty, um, who's been around for quite a while now, when we started, we were really trying to reproduce ourselves. I mean, we were, you know, not that every student that we took in became a linguistics professor, but that's sort of what we were trained to do is just reinvent ourselves in the classroom. And we have had to really shift and do much more career planning um, much more tracking of yeah. our students getting jobs, and they do. We really now can, which we couldn't before, answer the question, what do you do with a linguistics major? And um, what are the employment opportunities? But above and beyond that, I think it's really important for people who are, have kids coming to college or college students themselves to think that, to realize that what happened in the spring, as hard as it was and as hard as faculty worked, was not an ideal situation. So online delivery in last spring will not be the same as it looks in, in the fall. Excuse me. <coughs> um, our UVM, one very good thing that we're doing is we have a center for teacher, teaching and learning that has really stepped up with new technologies and new training. So the idea is that I think even though some of the education in the fall will be online, it it, it could be a really good experience in combination with other things for students. And I think all of the universities are really missing an opportunity to market this as, you know, this could be a really good thing, even better education than everyone just coming to campus and everyone going to the classrooms. It could be more innovative. It could be more, um, it could be more variable and it could be handle many, many more learning styles that students may bring to campus. Thank you. I'm going to go with Mike Kelly. I'm just curious, what is your institution doing or what we're, we're doing to adjust to some of the demographics and then now with COVID and then 
what what uh, what ideas have you heard that could be uh, creative solutions? So one of the things that we were doing pre-COVID at Champlain uh, was starting to, um, uh, there was a big institutional emphasis on project-based experiential learning. Uh, because what we're finding is that uh, our students are coming into college uh, smart, but differently smart than uh, any of us probably were going into college. So the amount of uh, sort of built-in Jeopardy style uh, knowledge that they're bringing with them is less, but they know how to do a lot more uh, and they know how to access what they need to uh, achieve, to solve a problem or achieve a goal or learn something new. Uh, and so I think that uh, what the best case scenario for project-based learning looks like is that uh, we can uh, teach them how to uh, teach them the context for the world that they're going into, uh, teach them the best uh, methods to get after the knowledge that they want to have, uh, and use uh, th these things as opportunities to uh, be a bigger part of the community uh, and, sor and sort of forge relationships that we haven't had before between the institutions of higher education and the communities that they can serve better than they do right now. Uh, so I think that that's a real uh, potential upside to the way that uh, teaching and learning is happening uh, in, in not just at Champlain, but in higher ed more generally too. Dave, I'm going to go to you and, and hear your thoughts, particularly the NVU campus, but, but either or. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. I know that there's, there's two main ways that at least NVU Johnson has been trying to evolve. Um, first, they have been, have been making a concerted effort in the last five to six years to address the lack of any kind of diversity, but particularly racial and ethnic diversity at NVU. Um, and they have done this partly by going into Burlington and tapping into an increasing number of uh, second generation immigrants uh, or, or the children of uh, immigrants. And partly by going to big cities, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and trying to recruit the kinds of students that were not traditionally coming anywhere near a place like NVU. And this is good for those students who now have, you know, some potential new opportunity. But it's also really good for the kids that grow up in small towns in Vermont, uh, such as Johnson or Hyde Park or Eden or Montgomery or Enosburg Falls, where they don't get much exposure to the non-white, uh, perhaps Protestant, certainly Christian perspective. So to get, uh, you know, Somali or Sudanese kids from Burlington or, um, non-children of immigrants, but from bigger cities on the East Coast, gives a lot of the students at NBU uh, a different kind of an education. And I don't know if this has necessarily been designed primarily to address the social needs of the traditional students of Vermont, or simply to just expand the, the, the client base of the school. Either way, it's been very helpful. And as a teacher of first year courses, I can see this regularly. Uh, every, every fall, it seems like uh, there are more uh, diverse non-white students around, which I think is very, very positive for everybody, for them, for the school, uh, et cetera. The second thing that the school has done to try to address economic concerns was the big merger between what used to be Johnson State College and Linden State College to create Northern Vermont. Um, it's reduced, obviously, a bit of redundancy, and I, I am hoping, but I don't really know, that it has allowed programs at either school to focus more intensively on what they're doing because they're not trying to do everything because they've eliminated a lot of programs that might have been redundant. Um, as far as the future goes, I have heard a hassle of speculative ideas, none of which are official, none of which are sanctioned, and most of which are not likely to happen. So unless you want me to traipse off into wild speculation, I'm going to wrap up there. If you want me to go off into wild speculation, I'm sure I could. There have been a couple of what I would consider to be interesting ideas, but again, I can't imagine they're going to get off the ground and they're totally unofficial and I don't want to be speaking out of turn. Well, we'll have uh, Mike Bezier give a little bit and I might come back to you, Dave, because I think between okay. this conversation and the wrap of like magic wand, you know, maybe you can give us some of those ideas if you think they are ones that okay. should happen. But I'll go to Mike uh, to stay on this first topic before we go into wild speculation. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, well, I'm, I may offer some wild speculation as well. 
Um, I think that there's been over the over the past uh, 40 years this tension in higher education between our our role as a, a humane institution in society and the business imperatives were increasingly called on um, to meet. Um, and that comes to a fore at an institution um, like ours, uh, where um, re tuition revenues pay our bills. Um, when we face declining, declining um, enrollments, then we have to curtail programming. At the same time, we need to develop new initiatives uh, to reach out to students. Um, so one of them has been, one of the initiatives has been to diversify our student body, which is a humane goal, um, as well as a practical goal, um, a business-oriented goal. And that's a significant challenge in a community um, like Northern Vermont. It's not the, even when we reach out to institutions, um, they're not the kind of support for many students of color um, that they would need in a community. And so we need, we need to kind of reinvent what that experience is going to be like for them, um, institutionally in a, in a shared environment between all of us. Um, we've instituted new programs in public health and criminology after much debate amongst the faculty about what these programs would accomplish. Um, and one of our perspectives, which combines this, you know, these are attractive um, job oriented degrees, um, but our critical engagement and our liberal arts approach makes them critical degrees as well. So we're not training people um, to, be, to be a particular kind of, of a job candidate, but to be a critical job candidate, a critical professional in the world. Um, I think overall that in, in the COVID crisis and going forward, we have this the conflict between the humane nature of the institution and the business nature of the institution is only going to make things worse. Um, and, and I feel like government's going to leave higher education behind as states and the federal government face significant um, deficits and shortfalls, um, revenue shortfalls in the years going ahead. And for all the reasons that we talked about, that, that this is not a time um, to cut on the backs of education. Um, it's a, actually a time to invest in and reimagine education. Um, but reimagining education means that public investments need to leverage the institutions themselves. Institutions with endowments need to spend their endowments. We're fortunate at St. Mike's to have an endowment. We need to spend more than just what the endowment earns. We need to spend from the endowment. Other institutions need to do the same if, they're, if they should be able to access public support of any kind. Um, as well, there needs to be more equity in um, the compensation within the institutions so that administrators are paid uh, in relation to the lowest paid member of the community, um, not regardless of what the structure of pay is across staff and faculty. Right? And those things can really shift the business culture um, back to its humane roots. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up uh, the ratio of pay. I remember um, the graduate speaker at my UVM graduation was uh, one of the CEOs of Ben and & Jerry's. And when they first formed, they had a, I think it was a one to seven ratio. The, the top top pay in the, in the company couldn't be more than seven times the lowest pay in the company. Uh, but of course, our society's mentality has moved to sort of Wall Street mentality, quarterly returns, uh, and so forth. And, you know, that's even impacted the relationship of businesses and higher education institutions. Businesses used to pay to train their employees to have more interns that they carried the costs for. And many of those expenses they've been plunking on to the education uh, system mm -hmm. um, while getting their taxes cut at the same time. So all these things are manifestations, I think, of that that larger systemic change over the last number of decades. Um, but David, I want to get back to you for a minute on, um, on uh, some of what you've heard, uh, but also some of the other two speakers um, want to chime in after David, let me know, and then we, we'll get to the wrapper. Okay, the wild idea, which sounds really, really interesting, but I, I, I am reluctant to bring this up. I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. I'm reluctant to bring this up because I don't want the administrators of the Vermont State Colleges to start getting peppered with questions from the public about this because it seems like a good idea, but it is very impractical in a lot of ways. Uh, one idea that I have heard 
is to create at NBU uh, something that amounts to a cannabis studies program, which is certainly giggle worthy on its face. However, uh, what this could do um, is it could create programs that are related obviously to botany, uh, programs that are related to medical and other uses for CBD. It could create programs uh, about you know, marketing and business. And this could in fact be a really, really good idea because it could attract students from all over the country that think, wow, I can actually go study how to grow marijuana or how to run a marijuana business or how to you know, learn to create health products or pharmaceuticals or cosmetics or whatever else related to uh, cannabis. And this, although it is fraught with potential issues, and I mean fraught, it does actually present an idea for how to create a new base of student client customers. Um, and it would distinguish us from a lot of places. But marijuana is still illegal, according to the federal government. And I think that's going to cause a lot of problems, potentially, for creating something like this. Um, I, I know, you know, if, if Jeff Sessions, the previous attorney general, had his way, we'd be reinvigorating the national drug war. So the viability of this option is dependent upon too many things, I think, for it to be really a good idea. But that is the kind of fairly wild outside the box thinking that could reinvent the school and provide it with a way forward. But, but again, it's right. got a lot of issues and I would be hard pressed to see how all those issues could be dealt with as the current political landscape is. Well, actually you may or may not be aware, but Castleton actually is doing that. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, no, I've, uh, I've been down there to speak a little bit about it because the policies in the legislature and that I've worked on for a long time as a legislator uh, prior to becoming Lieutenant Governor um, around medical use, because there's also medical uh, studies, as you said, pharmacological potential. Uh, so Castleton, I think, has de been developing that over the last couple of years, and they've seen tremendous interest. So I don't know that it would work to have another one of the campuses doing the same no, thing. No, no, I don't but, think it would. <laughs> but there's also uh, conversations around uh, elder care and nursing, uh, areas that we know in Vermont we're seeing huge shortages and many retiring uh, people over the next five and ten years uh, aging out of those professions and so I think maybe along the same lines of new programs to meet a demographic or to attract students uh, there may be some other arenas as well um, I don't know if uh, Mike K wants to chime in on that real quickly before we go to the closer but um, Mike do you have ideas uh, what I would when after Mike came. Oh, Julie, yeah, sure. Or if Mike uh, doesn't, we. You know, so the only uh, the the one thing that uh, may be obvious that we haven't touched upon, I don't think maybe as much as we ought to, is uh, that we are that most American families are living in a time where the cost of higher education isn't something that's viable, uh, and until we're able to. Uh, get the price of higher ed down to uh, a number that's, uh, that's reasonable without students incurring uh, six figures worth of debt that they're paying off for a really long time. It's gonna be really hard to have standalone innovations uh, solve this bigger structural problem. And so uh, I know uh, and agree with uh, how, largely with how we were talking about uh, online uh, learning at the beginning, but, uh, one of the potential bright spots that we might be able to take away from the pandemic uh, is the uh, is to leverage all uh, all the different teaching and learning opportunities and mediums that we have uh, in order to drive the overall price of higher education down for students and families. Yeah, thank you, and, and Julie, you want to throw something in before we get to the end here? Sure. Yeah, just briefly, I went. Not that this is as um, much fun is perhaps a cannabis program, but, or is, um, um, is vi well, it is viable. But anyway, um, I just wanted to put in one more plug for uh, if these programs, these new inventive, innovative programs are to take place, they're really going to involve a collaboration between faculty, st staff, and administration and I think this corporate structure of the university, at least of UVM, is really working against that. 
And it's, I think it's just critical for the administration to start listening to the rest of us who um, also have our areas of expertise and can do some of these things, but at least um, right now that's not happening is in a way that I'd like to see. Well, I mean, the, the corporate mentality, whether it's uh, sort of more conservative or neoliberal has somewhat taken over most of governance, uh, that it's um, not looking at the, the impacts because uh, really every economic system has its pros and cons and some blend of them is probably what we need. But we've been going to uh, the lowest denominator across the board, whether it's a corporate structure for higher education or underpaying you know, essential workers in our state who uh, are minimum wage workers. Uh, and so this disparity has been stretching to a bubble of wealth at the top and everyone else fighting to get by. And that's been an issue as uh, Mike just said, with the cost of higher education, it's been getting more and more out of reach for folks with too much debt. Uh, so with the magic wand, you all get a magic wand and um, you get to think about how should higher education adapt to the world we now live in and how can the state of Vermont support the changes you think should happen? And this is sort of a lightning round. You get about a minute each uh, to wave your wand and say, how should we adopt and what should the state do? And if it includes spending more money, where do we get more money? I'm all ears. Yeah, nobody wants to jump on that one. <laughs> hey, well, try it as a polit political figure. Yes, it's a lot yes. harder there than it is as in your shoes. The buck stops with you, sir. Um, I, I, will, uh, I, I, I will give it a whirl. Um, my, my main overriding concern is finding some way to address the economic needs of students, particularly at a place like NVU. I, again, I also teach at Champlain. The concerns are not as pressing there. I have students, I have had students at Johnson who do not have proper winter coats. Mm -hmm. I have students who have trouble coming up with <laughs> you know, access to health care because there is no on-campus facility at NVU Johnson. Uh, there is no clinic in the town of Johnson. People have to go, I, I think it's Hyde Park. Uh, maybe it's Morrisville. Either way, things like this uh, and it, that are exacerbated by COVID-19, I have students who don't have proper high-speed internet access, so how are they supposed to go along with remote learning? My wand waving would simply be, let's find a way to address all of these needs first and foremost. But you know, again, without a wand, I don't know how I'm gonna come up with that. It's easy to say tax the rich, tax businesses, and I love those ideas because I'm not a business and I'm not rich, but we, we can't chase the business community out of Vermont in the big picture. So I'm afraid I've just got desires. I don't have any answers, which is probably what the politicians don't need to hear. <laughs> but uh, Well, I, we all need to work together to come time. up with them. There is, there, there is no such thing as a magic wand except in Harry Potter. But uh, tax the rich. I saw Mike uh, Bezier about to speak. So yeah, so I would say um, one thing is, is obvious, that the, the federal government is the only institution in American society that could absorb massive amounts of debts with low cost. And so a lot of the support that institutions are going to need, both state institutions, state government, um, and high institutions of higher education and K through 12, is going to have have to come from um, a new directive from the federal government um, in response to the, cri the many crises we're facing right now. The second is to use that money at the state level um, wisely, which means leveraging these kinds of changes that we can see to restructure the way that higher education does business in Vermont. Um, and that means, as I said, spending down the endowment if the endowment is available to spend down. Um, renegotiating bonded debt. I think all of our institutions have bonded debt that's run through the state bond agency. Um, and re renegotiating the obligation to make it more long-term will reduce um, uh, uh, budget costs for all of our institutions and reduce financial pressures. Um, leveraging uh, compensation structures and contracts within institutions um, and also leveraging tuition costs. Um, through the provision of public support. So not just giving institutions money, but making institutions plan for how that money is going to change the institution itself. 
So this is a, a very magic, powerful wand. Uh, but I would like to see uh, the American public value expertise more than it's currently being valued. So in the past two months, we've seen uh, the power, I think, of what higher education is capable of doing. Uh, the public health officials who are working uh, diligently to develop vaccines for, co for COVID, uh, who are developing protocols that allow us to get back to a somewhat normal sense of reality. Well, those people are primarily uh, coming out of institutions of higher ed. Also in the past uh, six weeks, we've seen uh, the tides start to change in the way that the American public is starting to recognize and see uh, systemic racism and how structures have impacted the ways that uh, are, uh, you know, the historical roots of, ra of how race, uh, the problematic aspects of race in our culture. Uh, and these are things that scholars, uh, primarily scholars of color, have been uh, talking about within the academy for a really long time. And, and as a culture, we're just now starting to uh, come around a little bit more to seeing these things. And so these two really important happenings in 2020 uh, are both rooted in expertise and, and also uh, coming from within the academy. And as a culture, I think it's really important to recognize that and that will drive the kinds of uh, investments that we need to see in order to uh, make all of this happen. So what you're going to do on the state level for that, <laughs> I don't know, but it was a magical one. Yeah, you got it. And uh, Julie, why don't you wrap us on uh, that question? Okay. Um, yes, with my uh, magic wand, I would increase collaboration across institutions and between government and the higher ed in institutions because it's easier to make hard decisions and do things you don't want to do, but you should do if you see other people are making similar sacrifices. So yes, I don't have an example, uh, a solution for where the state gets more money, but I think the state should support higher ed in a way that we are not at the bottom of the nation and find a way to do that. And yes, I think universities and colleges with endowments should spend them at this point to um, support higher education, but neither of those entities want to do either of those things so I think they need to get together and, and say, okay, we're all going to work for higher education. Well, thank you. And um, I think uh, Mike Bezia brought up the, the, uh, the debt issue. It might've been one of the others, um, but the bonded debt, uh, I was told that somewhere deep in the CARES Act is the opportunity to refinance state debt. And I wonder if at least for the state funded institutions that are represented on this panel, um, some of their debt would fall into that to be um, refinanced some of that debt down even close to 0%. Uh, and this is something that could also be looked at for our K through 12 system debt in our town by town as a way to greatly restructure some of the costs that are being borne in a long-term basis by our institutions. And I've still got more research to do on that, but uh, Jay Denault told me about that from up in Franklin County. Um, so I'll be bringing that up with the state treasurer and, Maybe that opens up some dollars uh, in other ways. So um, I do want to thank you all. What a, what a robust conversation with all kinds of different topics that came up. Uh, each of you, thank you for bringing your experiences and expertise uh, and all the roles you play at your universities and colleges with respect to both what you're teaching and the, uh, the roles you're taking with your faculty unions and, and, um, and leadership on your campuses. Uh, I really appreciate it. I want to thank those who have been watching with us and uh, if folks have further thoughts, either the four guests or anybody watching now or later, uh, please reach out to info at zuckermanforvt.com. That's info at zuckermanforvt.com. Uh, we're always interested in hearing from folks, uh, anybody who knows in my service, it's been about bringing more people into the process and uh, that includes in these conversations. So thank you for joining us uh, and thank you to my uh, our four panelists uh, for being here today.